Modern software can be big and complex. Its creation can involve lots of people. And even before the global pandemic, some of these people may be widely spread across the globe. Remote distributed teams, often in different time zones, add new layers of complexity to the development process. So what does it take to make working with remote geographically distributed teams a success? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Uh, welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus and Specflow. They're helping us to build our channel. And so please do support them by checking out their links in the description. My book, Continuous Delivery Pipelines, is currently the top of the bestseller list on LeanPub. So if you'd like to help me keep it there, or perhaps more importantly, if you'd like to learn about how to create or improve your deployment pipelines, check out the link to that in the description below too. There are lots of reasons why larger firms may choose to distribute development, but whatever the reasons, it's not an easy thing to get right. It's easy to make mistakes in organisation and development culture when working with distributed teams. And even the relatively easy part of the problem, getting the technology right, can be tricky too. Agile software development was originally conceived for small, co-located teams. But the economics of modern software development mean that it doesn't always work out like that. In post-pandemic world, we're nearly all distributed now anyway. So what makes it hard? How can we alleviate some of the difficulties that distributed working so often creates? Let me begin by stating what I think is probably obvious. The reason that working as part of a remote team is difficult is all to do with communication. If you and I are sat in the same room, sat next to each other, looking at the same screen or whiteboard or even at each other, then the quantity and quality of information that we exchange is vastly greater than any electronic alternative. We're going to pick up on subtle cues from one another. Oops, I annoyed him when I said that. Ah, I think she has an idea. I should shut up so that she can explain and so on. As humans, even nerdy humans like me, this stuff matters. Until we have full immersion VR meetings, remote comms simply operates at a lower bandwidth. Why is it more difficult to work with colleagues in a wildly different time zone? Because the bandwidth is even more restricted. Traditional organisations often attempt to overcome this problem by becoming more precise, more directive in the way in which they engage with the remote teams. It's common for remote teams to be instructed in great detail what to do. This really doesn't work. Because it takes nearly as much work to specify precisely what you want as it does to do the work yourself in the first place. Programming is a creative discipline and programming by remote control doesn't work very well at all. As a software developer, I see the world in terms of software systems. So what this reminds me of is two modules with feature envy. One part wishes it had more control, so it tries to tell the other part exactly what to do and how to do it. This doesn't work very well in distributed systems, and it works even less well in human systems. And yes, remote teamwork is a distributed system. It's just a human distributed system. So. Just like in a distributed system, the overall goal is to make the communications effective and efficient. And layered on top of that most importantly of all, effective on a human level. So our goal is to improve our, the bandwidth of our communications, or at least to use the limited bandwidth available to us effectively. Is anyone else thinking that this sounds like a coupling problem? Yes, me too. So what we really want are loosely coupled remote teams. Our aim is to allow remote teams to make progress, even when other members are not available or haven't told them what to do or how to do it. This takes the establishment of trust, as well as some more practical steps. Humans are tribal, so it's incredibly easy for us to trigger tribal behaviours. 
Those people in that team over there are all idiots. Those people stop us from doing a good job. We don't want, we don't want them to make us look bad, so we won't help them. And so on. My first practical advice is to recognize this human element and work to limit its effect. The best way to do this, when not involved in a pandemic at least, is to establish real human contact between the team members. Ideally, bring people from different sites to visit frequently, regularly. I once led a big distributed team. We had developers in London, Bangalore, Chicago and San Francisco. Development was nearly around the clock. We didn't always manage it, but as a guideline, what we tried to do was uh, arrange things so that there was always somebody from other sites at every site. Different people at different times, but always someone. We socialised a lot too. It's much more difficult to call somebody an idiot when you had a beer with them last week. It makes communication so much easier once you've established that real human contact. These visits should be more than just some kind of management tour of an offshore site. Make them working visits. We get everyone involved in doing real useful work together. Once everyone's back home, they will have a real relationship with the people that they worked with. And that will make comms flow much better. The next problem is how you structure the teams. At least for traditional firms, the commonest pattern probably more like an anti-pattern to be honest, is to move particular function offshore. Remote developers or de remote test, for example. I worked with a team that had all of the product owners, architects, compliance people in Europe and all of the testers and developers in India. There were many teams, but each was geographically split right down the middle. The problem with this is coupling again. An effective development team is cross-functional. It has all of the expertise it needs to make progress as part of the team. If half of the team is sat at different desks, let alone in different time zones, this is a barrier to communications. So how you structure uh, the distribution of your team has a significant impact. The example I just gave, having teams geographically split by role, is the commonest strategy and the worst. It's very difficult to make this work well. A much better approach is to have all of the roles needed for a team at each location. Split teams by functional responsibility and have all of the people working on that collection of features, uh, whatever their role, sitting close together. If you must try and make the geographical role split work, then I have a couple of pieces of advice. First, avoid attempting programming by remote control. If you're a remote product owner, make your requirements say what the system should do, not how it should do it. This allows you to define the strategic intent and development teams then to work on the detail of how to achieve it. The comms for this is clearer, simpler and less fragile. To be honest, that's good advice anyway. Uh, if you're a product owner, whatever the t wherever the team sits. But it's even more important for remote teams. In general, guidance from a distance, whatever its nature, should identify goals and desirable outcomes, not detail the specifics. The aim of a consumer of remote services is to manage the very limited bandwidth effectively. So try and talk about directions and guidelines rather than precise details. Coach the remote teams, maybe on one of your regular visits to see them in person, on what it is that you need from them, and learn what it is that they need from you. This brings me to my second piece of advice for these badly shaped teams. As a developer, if I'm doing well, I'm going to learn things and that's going to make me want to ask questions. Lots of questions, all of the time. This is the reason why sitting close together is the easiest way of working. If I'm a developer in a remote team and I have a question and my product owner or architect is in another time zone, it's not going to be very efficient for me to stop work until the next day when they become available before I can ask my question. I suggest a trick to solve this or to alleviate the costs of this problem. Assign somebody on the local team to kind of channel the remote person 
product owner, architect, lead developer, whoever that person might be. And aim for this person to act as a kind of local proxy to answer questions. Their role is to try and imagine the way that the remote person who's not available would answer the question. Um, well, I think Joe would say this. Then the local proxy talks to Joe and tells them how they answered. This is a good chance for Joe to coach the proxy person, to grow their understanding so that the next time a question comes along, they will answer it in an even better way. This works particularly well if there's a local person who is interested in developing their career in the direction of the remote person's role. If you're working as part of a remote team, try and avoid the feeling and the reality of deferring all decision making offshore. It's important that you take local responsibility for your own work. Try to encourage remote managers to set direction and try to steer them away from micromanagement and remote control programming. My experience has been that there's good and bad development all over the world. People worry a lot about cultural differences, and these are real, but in my opinion, the bigger barrier is the human problem of attempting micromanagement from a distance. If you've hired these people, you have to allow them the freedom to do a good job. If you have been hired, you have to take responsibility and do a good job, and not expect to be instructed in detail at every step. The biggest cultural difference that I have seen is not about race or geography, it's about the commercial relationship. Remote teams are often seen and often see themselves as a kind of service function. In commercial terms, they may well be that, but the problem is that it stops them from saying no, or that's a stupid idea, or we don't know how to make that work. I've said on this channel many times that I think that software development is a process of learning and discovery. So we need to tell each other what we need and sometimes point out mistakes or unreasonable demands. That's part of the learning process too. That makes a nice link to talk about the technical problems. Remote teams are often seen as a bit of an afterthought. It's easy to give them lower priority, particularly if one of the reasons for employing them is to save money. It's ridiculous, though, to pay maybe hundreds of people in a far-off land to do work and then not give them the tools that they need to do that work effectively. As I said at the start, bandwidth is a problem. Good software development is driven by great version control, continuous integration systems, deployment pipelines, wikis, requirements management systems, and so on. These things need to work, and they need to work efficiently. This can be complex for distributed teams with large shared code bases. Skimping on telecoms and infrastructure can be very expensive. You can alleviate some of the distribution problems with local caches of information, modularizing systems and having the repos local, uh, but all of this takes work and investment to make it work. When it comes to remote team working, all of us have become more familiar with that over the past year. Continuous integration and continuous delivery help a lot. Having automated systems to evaluate our changes and make them quickly and efficiently available to teammates is a fantastic tool for collaboration. Where members of the same team are distributed, I've seen handovers accomplished by passing on a failing test sometimes. It gives, a very clear, it gives the receiver of the test a very clear place uh, to start and often offers an effective way of finding their way into the problem. The technicalities of managing the comms bandwidth problem are worth considering too. Large open group meetings are difficult when distributed. Tools like Zoom, Microsoft Teams or Google Hangouts can help, but it's still difficult to get everybody engaged in those sorts of online meetings. Different languages, even different accents, can be a barrier to communications. So it's very helpful to supplement any online live comm strategy with asynchronous written communications too. That can help overcome accents and language barriers sometimes. Email, sure, but chat tools are better, uh, allowing us to see the history of a conversation and to jump in at whatever point makes sense to us. 
I spent a couple of years based in London, working most closely with a team that was based in Chicago. We did pair programming when our time zones overlapped. Lots of people worry about the complexities of remote pair programming, but in my experience, the tech is no barrier at all. As a minimum, all you need is voice, screen sharing, and continuous integration. When I was working with the team in Chicago, though, we worked for a financial trading firm who were fairly well off, to be honest. So they gave us a very large TV screens and always on video conferencing. We set them up so that I was virtually in the middle of the Chicago team and they were virtually at the end of my desk. So I could look across to the team in Chicago and literally wave at somebody if I wanted to attack, attract their attention. This worked really, really well. I think that this kind of virtual telepresence will eventually be the killer app for virtual reality when they get it working well enough. Working as part of a remote team is always more complex than not. There are always compromises and costs. Until we have direct brain interfaces and telepresence that is indistinguishable from reality, it will always be more effective to sit in the same room. But as most of us have learnt over the past year, remote working is not impossible to do well. And it even comes with some of its own benefits. I hope you find some of the ideas in this video helpful. Thank you very much for watching.